delighted to have uh, this partnership with Quera Computing, which we started earlier this year. And um, this is going to be the first of pr probably a few trainings we have from them. This is the agenda for today and tomorrow, including links to training materials and a Q&A document that you can fill out. If you have questions as we're going, we will have a Q&A session at the end of tomorrow, but you're welcome to write your questions while uh, the session is happening today and tomorrow. Uh, and we're very happy to have Pedro Lopez, uh, who is a business developer at Quera. Who, Pedro has a PhD in theoretical physics. He has experience uh, in quantum matter and topological physics and uh, is a great communicator of science. And he's going to be leading us through uh, some of Quera's software and hardware and what we can do with neutral atom computing. And we also are very lucky to have three of NERSC's NERSC researchers, Jan, Siva, and Mark, telling us about their experiences using Quera's hardware and software. So with that, I'll pass it over to Pedro. Hi, Katie, and hi, everybody. Thanks for the introduction, Katie. Uh, it's uh, not a fully well-known, uh, I don't know, fact, but recently my position at Quera changed. I'm officially uh, the quantum advocate of the company. So, but it's true that I, for the past uh, like one year and a half, I've been working the business development team. Uh, it's it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, I don't know, introduce you Quera, introduce you a little bit of uh, quantum computing with neutral atoms. So I think we're going to have uh, a good time. I will start by uh, sharing my screen and let me make sure I pick up a few of the interesting items here. I think I got everything. Uh, let me know if you can see my introduction slide here. Yes. That's what you're seeing. So before I go through that though, I want to stop uh, uh, at our GitHub page just to give you a little overview of uh, what we have here. So if you go to the link that uh, Katie sent uh, or sh showed in the beginning of the, uh, of the first slide, but I can actually paste it in the chat right now. Uh, if you go here, you see a lot of our, well, the, it's a building, we are building up this repository and uh, it contains everything that we do for education, including, uh, uh, you know, clearly and uh, very overviewing instructions on how to install Blockade and Julia. So we'll be using this package today and tomorrow a little bit. So it's our, it's, you know, it's an open source package, but uh, Quera is the main maintainer of it. Um, it's uh, blockade is used for both uh, simulating, uh, but also to submit jobs to our actual quantum computer called Aquila. We will be covering between today and tomorrow uh, a lot of the materials from session one and two because of timing. It's, uh, you know, we're not going to go through every single uh, detail there, but I encourage you to download the materials that uh, are down here are inside here so you have some Jupyter notebooks that you'll be able to run in case you install as uh, is explained on the readme file in the first page there's some uh, handouts as well as a copy of the slides that you'll be seeing so given that uh because time is short I will just uh, jump into it and uh, we'll be starting really with just a brief introduction to the company because as uh you know, experience shows not everybody knows of us. Uh, so very well, uh, Quera, we build quantum computers. We are a hardware company, but we actually are a full stack. Uh, you know, we have a full stack approach to it. We build software, hardware, algorithm solutions. Uh, we do everything. Uh, cook, clean, you know, iron. We do <laughs> really everything. And uh, uh, so by now, we are a team of uh, about uh, 50 uh, uh, so even though we uh, consider ourselves a startup, it's not like a five people in a garage anymore. We are 50 people among physicists, uh, engineers, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. The scientific roots of the company are at Harvard and MIT. So two founding uh, scientific founders are professors at Harvard, and two of them are professors at MIT. So you can get a little bit of a feeling of um, what we are doing and uh, how fast we are doing. And so... A lot of people have not heard of neutral atoms as a technology for quantum computing, or if they have heard, they they, they might realize that it's a quite new entrance to this competition 
quite often people focus on uh, ion traps or superconducting qubits. And uh, so neutral atoms is really, is, it's, it's really the, the most recent entrant on this. And for you to get that, that feeling, so in 2015, so this is a empty optical table that uh, was uh, uh, the beginning of the uh, of the of the the experiments that became the technologies of today. This was in uh, Michel Looking's lab at Harvard. So you can see that in 2015, this was really an empty optical desk. And in a couple of years, that optical table had uh, a setup that could control and do study the dynamics of uh, about 51 qubits, meaning 51 atoms. So. Uh, I'm gonna go through the details of atoms and atoms and qubits and qubits and atoms, but for all that we care, it's the same thing. Uh, two more years, and uh, they were demonstrating uh, efficient gates, like the two qubit gates and one qubit gates, and uh, we spun a company out of the university lab because we realized that it was a good time to start commercializing this. And in two more years, and uh, both Harvard and uh, uh, us at Quera, we created machines that could uh, manipulate up to 256 qubits. And as of last year, we have been the sole quantum computing company uh, that uses neutral atom technology to provide open access to, well, not open access, but public access to uh, neutral atom quantum processors. So uh, this means that anyone can access them. They, the access is done via, deployed via AWS. Uh, of course, it's not uh, free, but uh, it's public. All you need is to create an account and you're good to go. So you don't have to, to I don't know, convince anybody that your experiments should be done, et cetera, et cetera. It's really like open for everybody. And the lesson of this timeline here is just to get a feeling that in seven years, we went from uh, an empty optical table to a company coming out to product development and pro product deployment, right? So in seven years, the technology really goes from zero to one. It's extremely, extremely fast. So uh, if you have not heard of us, that's normal. We This is all very recent, but uh, I am quite convinced that you'll hear more and more from us, particularly because of uh, support and uh, collaborations like we are doing here with uh, uh, the NERSC team. So uh, a little bit of a kind of a vision on how we approach quantum computing at Quera. So this is no judgmental over anyone's technologies. And uh, uh, this is really just to explain to you a little bit how we, how we succeed at going so fast and why we think that we uh, have a, a special approach to building quantum computers. So this is just uh, inspirational. There is no scales in this diagram. There's no nothing. Okay, it's just really to to big picture, right? And I think that it's fair to agree that uh, um, if you want to challenge classical computing, we need quantum computers, and uh, we all want uh, fully programmable and high scale, large scale, fault tolerant quantum computers. Now. To get there in at some point in the middle of the way, there must be something that is what I'm gonna call the computing edge, right? It's a, 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 a scale of compute power where your quantum computer is doing something that your classical computers are not. And I think that it's probably a fair statement that we want to all cross this computing edge because as soon as we do that, uh, the machines there are self-justified. So most of the companies out there, they are following a path that goes through picking up a, a technology, creating a qubit, making sure that they can rotate that qubit in any possible way, then putting two together, then putting four together, then putting eight, and then so on and so forth. So they created the full programmability as fast as possible, and then they just scale, multiplying what that, uh, that previous machine was doing. But what we see is a sort of a Zeno's paradox, where these machines, they keep growing slowly in size by just repeating their uh, unit uh, elements. But we don't see, like we, we keep getting closer, but every time we get closer to this compute edge, we are getting slower and slower and slower. You know, the, the progress is, is, is hard to, to, to visualize, to, to see uh, uh, technologies passing this uh, or, or the, the quantum machines that people are developing commercially to, to pass this computing edge. So what we are trying to do is to take a different approach where we create machines that are as large as possible at scale, but not fully programmable. And we build programmability at scale, right? So instead of 
taking two qubits that are that can be programmed in any way and now making them four, we take 256 and now we say, oh, we are going to do this set of operations on it. In the next generation, we are going to do this other set. And this way, we are being able to create machines that, first of all, gets to the computing edge first. And second, that uh, uh, is we are not caught by surprise realizing that when you double the system size, the, 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 you know, the performance is not there yet. So the solutions for a quantum computer, they have to, 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 to satisfy the needs of a machine that operates at scale. So in some sense, I think that the, the, the spirit of this discussion here is that uh, probably this fault tolerant quantum computer, you know, uh, a large scale, et cetera, that we are looking for is not just the sum of its parts. So uh, it's kind of an emergent uh, picture that, uh, that we may have for this, right? So we need to, to create something that uh, coordinates and orchestrates all of the qubits operation, et cetera, at scale, uh, instead of just uh, taking a reductionist approach of making copies of uh, smaller computing elements to try to get there. So that's uh, a little bit of our, our vision. I hope it's uh, inspirational to uh, all of you. How we do that, we use neutral atom quantum technologies. So uh, this means that we take atoms, we hold them in space. They live in a 2D space. We hold them using individual lasers. So these are um, uh, laser tweezers. So the laser has a little waist that holds this atom in place. And uh, uh, we then can have uh, very few control lines for the number of qubits that we have, like uh, seven to, to 10 lasers are enough to control hundreds and hundreds of, hundreds of qubits. And this also, this free uh, freedom of space and freedom of positioning the atoms actually is going to allow us to do uh, new approaches to, to quantum computing. So uh, we are very excited about it. This allows us to create very large uh, uh, registers also because the qubits are all equal and they don't complain about being put close together. So there's no, uh, you know, Coulomb repulsion. These atoms, they are neutral. So it's a very exciting for us. Uh, so exciting that we managed to put our first machine uh, online. It's the name is Aquila. It's a 256 machine up to actually you can run jobs with fewer qubits, um, not more. Uh, 256 is the limit for right now. And again, it's uh, available on bracket. And also through our friends at NERSC, uh, we are doing projects together and uh, we will be uh, finding new ways to to bring this technology to 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 nurse user base. That's, a, that's our goal, I guess. I probably don't need to tell you much about what is quantum computing, right? So it's all about the information processing. You go from classical, uh, the classical version bits, quantum version is qubits. So you go from a deterministic approach to a probabilistic, but with very well, you know, determined uh, probability distributions. The point of this uh, is is that uh, you are you probably used to looking at the logic of quantum computing made by quantum gates. So Aquila does not do gates uh, individually, at least not one and two qubit gates. So this is what we call the digital operation mode, where you have uh, individual gates. There are discrete commands that you, you are going to apply to one or two qubits at a time. What we are doing with Aquila is to uh, operate it in what we call an analog processing mode. Analog means that the unitary, the quantum unitary that uh, is going to operate on the qubits is going to be like just one big box here, right? So instead of many tiny boxes, it's one command that's gonna operate on all qubits and this is gonna be continuous in time instead of discrete. And uh, this is very robust to uh, a lot of errors because um, compounding gates is quite wasteful given that uh, you know our gates are imperfect, there's the coherence, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but also this is particularly efficient if you're going to study Arguably, the main important, uh, the most important application of quantum computing, which is quantum quantum simulation of quantum systems, right? So, the, then studying the dynamics of quantum systems, which in the digital operation mode would require you to do trotterization. But if you're controlling the evolution directly, there's no trotterization and no tr trotter errors. So, this is quite exciting for us. The downside of it is, of course, that this is not universal. So, this goes back to the picture I was mentioning before, where we uh, create a machine that is large enough, that addresses an, a large enough set of problems, uh, even if it's not universal, and we're going to build, uh, build uh, um, ne the next layers of uh, uh, programming complexity step at, one step at a time. 
given that you know, the universal applicability is uh, a downside here, uh, we have to do something about it when we do. So we operated this machine in what we call the field programmable qubit array mode. So uh, this is an FPQA. If you are familiar with uh, embedded systems and FPGAs, this, the idea is similar. The idea is that uh, we can take the qubits and reprogram the connectivity between the qubits so the user can define what the register looks like. So it's not going to be an octagon. It's not going to be a square lattice. It's not going to be a brick wall. It's going to be whatever you want. It can, it can be any of those things. It can be a square lattice, but it can be something completely different that is adapted to your problem. So... This control of connectivity is quite unique to neutral atoms. And uh, it also uh, uh, gives you many, many possibilities of thinking about how to encode problems in different ways. So that's something that uh, is not going to fully overcome the universal applicability of these processors, but uh, it gives you options that are not available uh, otherwise by other technologies. One thing that you can do, for example, is to uh, to leverage the geometry of a given problem to 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 enhance the capacity to solve uh, to solve problems by your quantum computer. So this is a map of Boston and Cambridge. If you have never seen this is what it looks like. And the idea is that if you want to position, let's say, coffee shops or an, any other type of store, uh, stores that are sitting too close together, they're probably competing. Stores that are too far apart are probably not covering enough uh, enough clients, enough customers. And uh, to try to solve the problem of how to best distribute your stores or coffee shops, and here we really like Dunkin' Donuts, what you do is you can create a, a, a you know, overlay with a map of the city, a set of prime positions for putting your, uh, your shops and creating edges whenever these atoms, these, uh, these uh, shops, they, they compete with each other. And I'm already doing a spoiler alert that we can actually create Boston in atoms, right? So this is a map of Boston, the same map that you're seeing here, made in atoms. So sometimes it's a little hard to see, but I think that when you look at this motif down on the right corner, right, you can see this same structure here. So you are literally taking each individual point here as an atom. It is an atom, actually. So these uh, purple, pinkish dots are individual atoms in Aquila. And you can position it in exactly the same way as uh, the city, the map of the city, and drive them to do calculation and solve the problem of figuring out where you want to position your uh, your coffee shops or whatever store that is. So this is a way of uh, leveraging the, the freedom of uh, changing the connectivity to, to improve your capacity to solve problems. So if you're trying to do this with a gate-based machine that uh, had a very fixed uh, position for the qubits, you would probably be hard pressed. We actually have tried and we, the, it's it's actually a useless comparison as far as we have figured out. So like the, the, the size of problems that we can solve are uh, much more interesting. Uh, we will go in details through what the qubits look like, but they're made of rubidium atoms. Two rubidium atoms looks like hydrogen. So it has two energy levels, the ground and the uh, uh, an excited level. So, so rubidium li lies in the beginning of your periodic table. So it looks really looks like hydrogen. It's just a single electron there. And the excited state here is a very, very high energetic state. We call it a Rydberg state. So if the principal quantum number of the ground state is five, the principal quantum number of this excited state is 17. So seven zero. And uh, when the atoms, they, they, they excite, they actually effectively increase in size. They become a kind of micrometer size. And uh, they become highly polarizable because of that. And that's how they see each other and then they can interact and then you can entangle them and perform gates or, or, or uh, the, the large scale analog simulations that uh, we'll be discussing. And uh, I'm gonna skip through this because uh, uh, this is just about the quantum register. We will cover that uh, in details in our second uh, uh, conversation later today. But I think it's important to realize that uh, this platform has had a lot of scientific success. So there are many groups working on it. There are groups in France, there are groups in California, in Chicago. Uh, turns out that I have to talk about my friends, so I'm going to talk about the, the uh, highlights of what has been done uh, at our uh, friends' uh, labs at uh, Harvard. But the point is that uh, uh, these machines have been used to do simulations of uh, phases, and in particular of critical uh, dynamics uh, of uh, phases of matter so you can compute uh, 
and uh, analyze critical exponents, et cetera, et cetera, things that are they can be quite difficult to do, in, particularly in two dimensions. Uh, I like this topic of many body quantum scars because this was discovered because people were running these jo jobs on, on uh, one of these uh, neutral atom simulators. So most of the times when you're running uh, a job in a quantum computer, you are doing a simulation of uh, of your you know your, your circuit, and then uh, you see what it's supposed to do. Then you run on your quantum machine, and what you see is that uh, well, it's at the at best it's going to be reproducing what uh, your quantum circuit told your machine to do. In fact, it's going to be probably worse than what you simulated because of uh, decoherence. But you will not be seeing anything other than what you had already simulated in your circuit before. Now, this is a phenomenon that people did not know about until they ran some experiments and they found this happening, right? So it was a discovery made by running jobs in a quantum computer. And they see some, some interesting behavior that kind of looks like a phase of matter uh, dynamic system where you have phase of matter that keep oscillating between each other. It's like a, you have ice and then you have water and then ice melts in water, then freezes again in ice, then melts again in water, and it keeps oscillating between those two states of matter which is quite interesting. Uh, these systems have been used to generate uh, spin liquid states. So these are in two dimension and they are excited states, they are dynamic states. It's very, very hard to simulate them classically and it's possible to generate them with uh, neutral quantum computers. And for a more practical point of view, we have also demonstrated uh, uh, optimization, just like the problem that I was mentioning not long ago uh, on the map of Boston. Uh, where we actually verify the Grover speed up. Uh, not, don't confuse that with computing faster than you compute with a classical computer, right? Because that depends on clock speeds, et cetera. But we have verified that if you try to optimize this uh, a certain class of problems uh, with neutral atoms, and you compare that with uh, 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 like a classical matching algorithm, what you see is that the quantum algorithm scales the square root better to to chance of solution as function of problem difficulty. And that's the type of Grover speed up that you expect to get uh, in, in this system. So these are a few of the applications that have been demonstrated. There is much more you'll be hearing from, from a nurse team a, a little bit about what they have be, been thinking about. Uh, but uh, that's uh, very exciting. We have a lot of uh, uh, new application directions also. So we've been working on simulation, a uh, lot of uh, high energy physics and uh, kind of uh, lattice gauge theories. So we have a, a few groups working with us um, in Europe and, uh, and here in the US to do simulations of uh, like string breaking and other phenomena. Uh, optimization of more general uh, scenarios also, the, other than this thing that we call the maximum independent set that we may talk about a little bit as we go along. And also we have been working on uh, a topic called re quantum reservoir computing to demonstrate uh, uh, that our machines can actually be used to learn. And uh, we have been having a lot of success with this. Uh, we are very excited about uh, doing quantum machine learning. And uh, I'm not going to claim that, uh, you know, Classical machine learning is very powerful, so I'm not going to claim that uh, quantum machine learning uh, is the next big, big thing. It might be or might not. But uh, as a matter of fact, we are being able to make our quantum hardware learn. So these are not uh, kind of simulated quantum machine learning. It's actual, actual quantum machine learning by a quantum hardware. So we're very excited about it. Now, to wrap up this intro, I just want to mention a little bit about the upcoming stories. So I mentioned that uh, what we have is this analog computing mode, but in the future we'll be working on gates and we are actually pushing hard to, to do gate-based computing as well in a way that uh, operates directly at large scale. When we do that, uh, we are not doing ground and Rydberg excitations anymore, but rather we are going to use a Q-trit. So there's two states in the, uh, in the ground that are hyperfine split and one Rydberg state that is used for entanglement. And... Uh, these guys down here, they are clock transitions, so they, they are very, very long-lived, like 1.5 seconds. And uh, just recently this year, our friends at Harvard have demonstrated that uh, uh, they are capable of uh, performing two qubit gates at 99.5% uh, fidelity at scale, right? So this is like 60 
gates in parallel, which is which is very very exciting, and it's really the state of the art. It's you, it's the same uh, uh, kind of precision of gates that you will get from uh, this the what has been done with ion traps or superconducting qubits, except that again like, we are arriving at this at lightning speed. It's it's really really very fast to the development. Uh, some uh, kind of uh, I don't know. Uh, Again, vision here. So this is a, a figure that uh, uh, was generated uh, by our friend uh, Hunter, Hannes Bernian at uh, U of Chicago. So this is definitely not Quera's work, but it's just a demonstration that uh, you can fit 10,000 traps for atoms inside an objective. So you take, can take a picture and image those 10,000 traps. So you can actually, in a single system, more or less like Aquila, and not really different, you can actually fit up to 10,000 qubits there. And uh, so without interconnecting you can actually really really scale this system up while keeping energy consumption quite uh, quite low so in order 10 kilowatts uh, in comparison with like hpc centers that are like 100 megawatts uh, by the way all of this all of nitro atom technologies they operate uh, in uh, uh, room temperature okay so there's no need for cooling things down there's no cryogenics and finally the point that we are probably most excited about is atom shuttling which means that uh, we use this capacity to reposition atoms uh, now at will during the calculation that allows us to entangle atoms far from each other. So we get all to all connectivity. In fact, what you're seeing here is the creation of a toric code uh, state. And uh, this means that we can create a zoned architecture where you have a processing region, a memory region, and a measurement region and few lasers to control all of the qubits. So we, you don't intend to control every single qubit individually. So it's really, really a simplified control budget for uh, engineering because it's really few lasers for many qubits. I like the analogy of uh, you know trying to change channel of your high def TV by having a con remote controller with one button per pixel, right? So you're not gonna change channels very soon. Uh, if you try to control every pixel individually. And for the same reason, you should not try to control every qubit in a quantum computer individually. You need a bus of information. That's how even your laptop operates uh, so that you can control what is necessary at a given moment. And finally, uh, this means really, uh, as I mentioned, auto all connectivity. This means that we are able to test different error correction strategies and uh, I think that it's going to be probably the only technology that is going to allow you to choose to test different error correction mechanisms without uh, uh, having to design, pre-design a chip with a, with a given architecture in mind, right? So by doing this, uh, uh, we can have uh, like an empirical test of what works best for error correction. So it's actually very, very exciting for us. Uh, we have been operating with many organizations in many different ways for solutions access and the sale, sales of machines. But uh, today we are gonna be focused on uh, on applications and how to use this, this machine. So we'll be talking a lot about Blockade, our software. Uh, you can access the documentation by scanning this, uh, this QR code, but also uh, uh, access through AWS that exists today. Uh, we'll be focusing on Blockade for the conversation. But if you are interested in access, please talk to us, talk to Katie and Dan, uh, uh, and we will we'll see how we can provide access to you. So I'm going to take a break. I'm going to drink some water. And I'm going to invite uh, our friends at NERSC to tell us a little bit about what they have been doing. Katie or Dan? Yeah, so our first our first speaker is going to be Jan. Um, take it away. Uh, hello, my name is Jan. Okay, my camera is here. Yes. Uh, so I had a pleasure to be invited to the first round of uh, guinea pigs to run on QR hardware. It was a very new environment for me, and I really appreciate all the help I got from you guys from Quera. Uh, I will show a few slides, uh, and then my colleagues will show more advanced slides to just give you some analogy. Okay, I should, I should start sharing. So this is like 
uh, building a rocket which uh, will go to the Mars. So what I will talk to you uh, is how uh, one does the static fire tests. I hope you know all the terminology. So I will show you very small examples. And then uh, Siva and Mark will show you really what you can do with harder trying to solve the real problems. So this is the picture I found on the internet. I hope it's not mid journey, it's real. Pedro, perhaps you can confirm. So this is how the how your hardware looks like. Well, so we now it's cleaner, <laughs> but yeah. <Okay. laughs> uh, so what I'm guessing you see here is the laser on this big black box and there is some optical elements to transport the light and under this black cloth is the uh, actual quantum computer, which is probably the size of like head of the nail. Uh, so this is what I have been working with. So uh, the first problem, okay, the first problem I wanted to address is, is it, can I control atoms? Uh, because my background in physics, I kind of believe that you can control it from Python script, single atom, but this is the proof I can. So what uh, you are seeing here is on the top right hand side, you see how I'm changing the frequency of the laser driving the transition from the ground state to the excited state and back for seven times. And this looks perfect. So now I run exactly the same experiment on the real hardware and you indeed see the oscillations which have the same period. Uh, you see also some differences that the amplitude of oscillation is decreasing, which means I am dealing with the atom which is not an isolation in the empty universe, but it's interacting with the environment and it's gradually losing it's coherence, so this is called relaxation time. This is non-phenomenon. We need to account for this when we do experiments. Also, the amplitude of the first maximum is not one, but it's smaller than one. This is called readout error. So you prepare state at one, but you sometimes mismeasure it as zero. We know how to deal with this. So it was very convincing. I see the real atom. The next thing is I want to see, can I now entangle two atoms? So if, if I put two atoms together, now they can be in the fourth state, up, up, down, down, or they could be up, down, and down, up. So by changing the laser frequency and looking and measuring at given point of time, what is the state, I can obtain the four curve on the right from the simulations. And now you see there is a special point of time when the two atoms are in the up, up, or down, down state, the blue values, but they are never in the uh, contradictory state. So up, down, and down, up. So the probability of those four combinations are listed on the right. Uh, so this is called the Bell state, this situation. So I wanted to reproduce the Bell state on the real hardware. And as we is shown on the left, and as you I got closed, I got roughly 40% probabilities of those preferred state with some contamination with the unwanted states, the mixed one, ground, uh, Rydberg, uh, Rydberg ground where we understand that most of this contamination comes from the readout error, so it's correctable. Uh, so now I see this is a proof for me that I'm really working with the quantum system and I have full control of it with some marginal errors. So uh, the third thing I want to show is how can I modify the uh, frequency of the driving laser field as a function of time to improve the result. So here my goal was to obtain a state which is one zero one zero and three zero is in the middle as shown on the right hand side here. And if I use a simple minded linear change of the frequency as a function of time, I would get a pattern as shown on the left. So it is interleaved, but it's it has a large unwanted component. However, if I run optimization, which is the hybrid algorithm where optimizer is running on a classical computer and the measurement is done on a quantum computer, then I can improve the quality of the state as shown on the pattern on the right. Uh, finally, uh, it's more technical, but typically the quantum computers don't come with the slurm. Uh, you are getting a Jupyter notebook where you just hard code your credentials and you run one job and you get the result. The, problem is that you may wait a week or two to get the job back. And this may lead to many technical problems like Jupyter Notebook may die. So I came with the scheme of running everything from the scripts. Uh, so uh, the first script submits a job and receives from the Amazon just the job ID, which is called ARN, and saves this all information in the HD5 file. Uh, 
And then a week later, I submit and I fire a different script, which just give it name of this file and it opens it. It finds the Jopperian, it asks IVS for results, stores them locally. And from this point, uh, analysis can be done independently on the cloud access, which is sometimes problematic. Uh, so I can run now on, I can scan over results from many measurements I have shown you on the pictures uh, earlier and get multiple analysis many times without bothering with the cloud access. So this is just showcasing is what I have learned. I have a few more things, but my colleagues will show you much better what they can do in terms of physics analysis. Thank you. Stop sharing. Okay, so next up is Mark. Hey everybody, I'm Mark. Uh, I'm an intern this summer working uh, on this uh, QERA nurse collaboration. Uh, I'm a grad student studying condensed matter theory. So uh, let's get this going. Can you see my slides now? Yep, we're good. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so I come from a condensed matter theory background. So um, what I was mainly interested in is studying many biphases or preparing and studying them with uh, Aquila. So um, the simplest phase that you can prepare, simplest many biphase you can prepare in, in, on Aquila is called a Z2 phase. And the idea with the Z2 phase is that the ground state ends up having this alternating pattern between atoms in the ground state and atoms in the excited state. And so I'll begin by just drawing some simple pictures explaining how you can, like how this, how this phase forms. So at the top, I'm showing two of the three important terms in the Hamiltonian. The left is the Rabi drive, which um, causes oscillations between the ground state and the excited state, uh, labeled G and R. And on the right is this detuning phase, detuning term, which uh, changes the energy of those two states. So when we have delta negative, it heavily penalizes having atoms in the excited state and is counting whether or not, it, and is counting the density of uh, Friedberg excitations. And so if we have de delta negative, then that's penalizing excitations and all the atoms lined up in the ground state, shown in this picture below with empty circles representing the ground state. If we instead have delta B positive, then that lowers the energy of rubric excitations and all the atoms then want to be in the excited state. But there's a third term in the Hamiltonian, which is this van der Waals interaction between um, rubric excited states. And this is a interaction that goes like one over R to the sixth and it penalizes having nearby atoms simultaneously be in the Rydberg state. And so what happens when you tune your parameters correctly is that um, all the atoms want to be in the Rydberg state, but the neighboring ones can't both be in the Rydberg state at the same time. And so you get this alternating pattern between excited states and ground states shown here. And this is the basis of the Z2 phase. And so the most of my work that I've been doing so far is trying to prepare this phase and study this phase and share this like um, the way that you build this on Aquila, it's pretty straightforward. Jan showed this very briefly in his slides. Um, this is an example of the waveform that you would use to prepare the phase. You start with the detuning um, constant and negative, and you sweep the uh, Rabi oscillation term from zero up to some finite value slowly. Then you keep the Rabi drive constant as you sweep the detuning from negative to positive. And as you do this, the idea is that you're slowly um, changing the system from wanting to have all the states in the ground state to having all of them want to be in the Rydberg excited state. And then as they sort of self-arrange themselves adiabatically, hopefully the system winds up in this Z2 alternating phase. Uh, this is a picture of an experiment I ran using this protocol uh, in two dimensions on a 13 by 13 grid. If you look at the borders of the phase, you can clearly see this alternating pattern of red, blue, red, blue, where blue is ground state and red is excited state. Um, but it gets a little bit messy in the middle, and this is mainly because of um, a lack of optimization like Jan did in his preparation or in this preparation uh, waveform, and also from a detail of how the um, van der Waals interaction decays. But we can see it more clearly if we study the uh, correlation function between Rydberg excitations. So in this picture, you can see the correlation as a function of the displacement between two atoms. Um, you can see it decays as you go away from zero displacement but it's a little bit complicated to understand because of this oscillation between positive and negative values. And that's coming from the fact that 
every other atom has opposite values. It's easier to understand if we instead look at the coarse grain magnetization, which is defined here as little m. This is a order parameter that tells you how closely the system is locally ordered in this um, alternating pattern. And from this picture on the left, you can see that for the uh, data that I obtained, it looks pretty good in the sense that besides maybe these two squares, everything is one color telling us that we have a single magnetization domain. We can do the same thing as before and calculate the correlation function for the magnetization. And uh, we get this nice picture here, which is uh, good because it's all in one sign. And you can see it's also uh, fairly isometric and that lets us do a radial average. Um, the radial average of this correlation function is shown on the right on a log scale, and you can see it fits very well to a decaying exponential. And we can extract the correlation length of the system from this de from the decay of this exponential. And this number gives us a way to characterize the quality of the state that we prepared. So this is a way that you can optimize the preparation of the phase without using simulations like uh, Jan did, because you know. Uh, simulating a 13 by 13 phase is going to be rather challenging. And so you can vary your preparation uh, waveforms and optimize this number to get the best state that's possible. And so this is exciting for a number of reasons. Primarily, uh, even with this very simple example, which is one of the first things that I did, it's already pushing the boundaries of what you can do numerically. Um, so the best algorithm that people use for studying this type of system is called uh, the density matrix renormalization group. And that system or that approach scales exponentially with the width of the system. And the best that I've seen for studying Hamiltonians like this can get only up to 12 sites in the transverse direction. So we're already beating that. And especially for um, quantum state simulators, I don't think there's any that can get anywhere close to 169 total atoms. So that's already pretty exciting that we can study things beyond what's possible with numerics. Another thing that's uh, exciting about this for me personally, because I come from this condensed matter background, is that it's really easy to change the lattice that you're studying and to study different phases. Rather than going through the nightmare process of trying to find a new material, working with crystal growth people and trying to isolate the physics that you want out of all the mess of the actual dirty materials, you just change your code and put the atoms into a different lattice and you can study different phases. And that's our goal going forward. Uh, we're going to, instead of studying this square lattice, we'll study more complicated lattices and that'll enable us to see more complicated phase diagrams, study the phase transitions and study dynamics in them. All of this uh, beyond what's currently possible with uh, classical simulations on uh, you know, classical hardware. Thanks, Mark. Yep. And up next is Siva. Great. Uh, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Katie, and thank you to uh, Mark Allen and Pedro for uh, your, your great presentations. Uh, so, so this work is uh, building upon the work that, that Mark and Jan did, um, and, and using the equivalent system to study uh, quantum dynamics, in particular a phenomenon called quantum many-body scars, which Pedro briefly mentioned. So uh, if we could quickly look at uh, uh, this Phenomena. Yeah. So, we, so what exactly are quantum dynamics? I mean, so they, one of the great um, advantages of what uh, uh, of the Aquila system, uh, which Pedro mentioned, is uh, the ability to kind of natively uh, uh, study quantum dynamics or, or simulate uh, quantum systems that have uh, the, the form of this uh, uh, Rydberg system. Uh, so, uh, and, and that's you know equivalent to running a quantum computer in an analog uh, mode. Uh, so, just to kind of quickly look at what what we mean by um, uh, quantum dynamics. So. Uh, a quantum system, the state of a quantum system is given by these states uh, psi of t, and then the time evolution of a quantum system is of, an, of a closed quantum system is given by the Schrodinger equation, which is given by this expression here. Uh, so we can see that the time evolution of a state is given by uh, the action of this uh, quantity called the Hamiltonian, h of t. So if you integrate this equation, then you get this second equation, which tells you that this, the state at a later time, simply given the state at an earlier time, time um, with a unitary time evolution operator acting on it. Uh, and this unitary time evolution operator uh, is simply given by the the you know integral uh, the exponential of the integral of this Hamiltonian uh, from a beginning time to a later time. Uh, so therefore, the 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 action of this uh, analog quantum computer is kind of given by by this uh, diagram here, which Pedro previously showed. Uh, the idea is that you have an initial state, and in the in, in the equal system, the initial state is always the state with all the atoms in the ground state. 
Uh, and then you apply this uh, time evolution operator U of t, which is uh, given by uh, in the integral of this Hamiltonian. And this Hamiltonian, you specify the parameters uh, to, into whatever shape you want in order to get whatever uh, time evolution you want. Uh, and then you finally get this final state, and then you perform uh, measurements on this final state, and then you're on it uh, in order to get uh, probabilistic measurement results. And then uh, Jan and Mark showed the the, the outputs of, of those measurements, of, of how you can manage the outputs of those measurements. Okay, so the kind of advantage of that cool system is that um, you, can, you can natively study uh, quantum dynamics, um, uh, which for uh, condensed matter systems that have the, the particular form of the Rydberg Hamiltonian, which, which uh, Mark showed and which we'll look at in the next slide. Um, or if you can uh, take other uh, physical phenomena and map them into this uh, Rydberg Hamiltonian, then you can also study those. And that's also a direction that we're, we're pursuing, which I'll, I'll briefly talk about at the end. Um, but before that, I'm going to focus on this uh, dynamics of the system uh, that's kind of native to the uh, the to the Bridberg, um atom system, uh, in which they actually kind of discover it, it while while doing their their experiments with the program system, and that phenomenon is called a quantum many body scar. So here on the right hand side, we just have a kind of a schematic diagram of what a quantum many body scar is. Uh, so if you have a many body quantum system, so a system consisting of many atoms that are coupled together that exhibits collective behavior, then um, a typical state in the system, if you prepare it and then let it evolve in time, then it'll uh, rapidly delocalize. Um, and then that's kind of shown by the uh, that's shown schematically by these two purple curves here. So in the in the top plot, we're plotting something called the entanglement entropy as a function of time, uh, uh, and and in the bottom plot, we're plotting the expectation value of some local observable as a function of time. So both these y axes just kind of measure how how localized uh, the, the the properties of state are. So you can see this purple curve for a typical state, things rap the state rapidly delocalizes as you evolve it as a function of time. Um, but then there's these particular classes of initial states, which are called quantum many body star states, um, such that it doesn't rapidly delocalize, but the, the state stays highly localized. And this is uh, a phenomenon they actually just, as Peter mentioned, they discovered um, uh, while studying these systems. Uh, so I kind of sought to, to simulate, the, uh, to firstly emulate these on the, the blockade emulator, and then to also simulate them on the Ecola hardware. Okay, so maybe just to, to firstly show the, the the configuration of the Ecola hardware. So, you know, Peter showed, um, uh, or, pardon me, Jan showed um, uh, the actual la laser setup. Um, uh, I, I guess Peter showed it as well. <laughs> so uh, they actually showed the actual like laser setup uh, and then the and the uh, the tabletop. Um, but here's just a schematic diagram of it. Um, so the, the the key thing is uh, where you're actually loading atoms is the kind of in this small box here, uh, and everything else uh, is, are these kind of complicated laser systems to help you control control the lasers in order to get the atoms to, to do what you want, to kind of arrange them and configure them, and also to perform uh, measurement, uh, you know, excitations on, on the atoms and also to perform measurements. Uh, so I'll only kind of highlight kind of two, two things which are relevant for the user. Uh, the first are what, what he calls these, these user, what are called these user programmable tweezers, which lets you control where you want to place the atoms. So this diagram here kind of shows that you can, you know, it, you kind of have like very generic control of how to place the atoms, so you can you know map create a map of the world, um, and then, uh, but then as, as a user, you don't actually have to program the the lasers themselves in order to decide where the atoms are. You just simply t t tell the system where uh, the coordinates of where you want to put the atoms, and it'll arrange that. But it does that by controlling these optical tweezers. Uh, and the second thing is uh, the user programmable um, uh, kind of laser drive. So so Mark should that so show that there's. This Robbie frequency and this detuning that you can control, and th those you actually do explicitly provide uh, as inputs as a user uh, in order to 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 you know control the dynamics of the system, and also then uh, uh, in order to you know produce the kind of uh, outputs that you want. Uh, so those you do you do explicitly provide. Um, okay, so for this quantum smart dynamics, what I want to do is provide. Uh, I just want to study this in one D, so I want to provide a one dimensional chain. Um, so I could have just provided you know provided a one dimensional chain. So here we would have just had a one D chain, and then. Um, and then repeat that uh, procedure uh, many, many times uh, for each time step uh, in order to get uh, uh, you know the output as a function of time. Uh, but then it's actually more efficient. I mean, the, the, but the queer, uh, the equal system can actually you know rearrange things in uh, two D atom arrays. So it's actually more efficient to to put a bunch of one D um, chains in parallel, which is so that's what this uh, diagram that right shows. This is what the ad actual atom configuration I had is. So I had uh, these nine atom one D chains, and I had five of those in parallel. Uh, and the, the separation between the chains is about three times the separation between the atoms, uh, such that there, we minimize the amount of chain-chain interaction uh, over the, the short, uh, you know, four microsecond time, time scale of the actual simulation. Uh, so as a result of that, then you actually end up conserving the number of shots that you need to use. And this is the, typically what you do when you run the kill system, if you want to do it in, in 1D, or, or even if you want to study, uh, you know, small clusters of, 
of interactions is you try to parallelize in the on the 2D system uh, in order to conserve the number of shots that you use. Um, so in terms of actual uh, uh, tasks, so each task corresponded to a time step in a time grid uh, over four microseconds and used a time steps of about uh, 0.1 microseconds. Uh, and then I and I launched 40 shots per tasks, and therefore that's equivalent to 200 effective shots per task for a 1D chain. Okay. Um, and then uh, Mark showed this earlier, but just to kind of uh, show this again, we have this uh, the the um, the Hamiltonian for the rubric system. We have this uh, Rabi frequency omega of t, which controls the coupling between the ground and excited states on each atom. And then we have the detuning term, which uh, kind of could, controls this uh, uh, river blockade uh, relative. Uh, or sorry, I should say, I mean, all, all these things are related to river blockade. But then uh, this will, you know, detuning term is a kind of a, a global term that controls uh, the excitation uh, excitation of the of each atom. Um, as well. And then we have the, the coupling term VIJ. Uh, okay, so then this, this plot here shows uh, uh, the Rabi frequency on the left side as a function of time, and then the detuning on the right side as a function of time as well. Um, so this waveform is broken up into kind of two stages. Uh, the, the first stage is identical to what Mark was doing, which is uh, adiabatic preparation of this Z2 ordered phase, where the atoms go from you know ground excited, ground excited, etc. So that's what these first two microseconds are, and you can see these, these uh, waveforms are identical to, to what, what Mark showed. Um, and then the second stage is that uh, you actually have to perform a quench. It's, it's, it's performing a quench uh, in order to observe dynamics uh, of, of the state that's prepared. So recall again that the in initial state of, these of the equilibrium is that everything has to be in the ground state. So if you want to actually run dynamics with a different type of initial state, then you have to adiabatically prepare that state. And that's what the first two microseconds are doing. And then once you adiabatically prepare that state, then you can change the Hamiltonian to, uh, to run the dynamics that you want on that new prepared state. Uh, okay, so uh, then we can just look at the results, which is the, in particular looking at the, the Rydberg densities, the densities of, of the atoms on each site. Uh, so the, the two plots on the right-hand side show classical emulation with the blockade emulator, which you, um, uh, which the, the QR team will talk about more in more detail. So this is just a classical emulation. These, these simulations were run on, on Perlmutter on, on a single node. And then, uh, so the, the plot here shows uh, the the sites, uh, the one through nine, as a function of time on the x-axis, and then the sites on the y-axis. And the color shows you the rubric density. So in the first two microseconds, we're preparing that Z2 state, which is alternating here between uh, uh, ground and excited. And then after that, we do a quench, and then we observe uh, the uh, oscillations. And these many-body oscillations are the quantum many-body scar. Uh, and this plot on the bottom just shows the same thing, except we're showing the rubric density on the y-axis and the time on the x-axis and the different curves are just the different sites. Okay, and then the, the two uh, plots on the right hand side, uh, pardon me, on the left hand side, are showing the actual hardware simulation with Aquila. Um, so you can see that the, the results are actually very, very uh, uh, robust. They're very accurate, uh, and they reproduce uh, uh, the, the, the many body oscillations uh, uh, with you know very uh, tight error bars, even with just a, a, a short number, a small number of, of shots. Uh, so I should, I should maybe just quickly say something about the workflow. So the, the typical workflow is that you do some type of classical emulation on the blockade emulator. Um, with a, a tractable system size that you can simulate on a, on a classic computer, uh, on like on one of the nurse, nurse, uh, 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 nodes. Uh, and then uh, then you would then after you kind of optimize the parameters in order to get the kinds of outputs you want, then you would run that on the hardware, uh, also with the same type of size in order to be able to compare the two. And then you would probably scale it up on the hardware uh, to be able to run it on a, a quantum system that you simply cannot uh, simulate on a, on a classical computer. Um, okay, so this kind of shows the uh, the quantum many scars or some the dynamics for uh, a system that you that is like native to the river Hamiltonian. But I should say we're also uh, look, starting to look at other things like um, uh, high energy physics phenomena and you know, production of, and uh, dynamics and collisions of quasi particles, uh, which we can which can be mapped into uh, the river system as well. Okay. Thank you, Siva, and thanks to all our NERSC uh, users who presented. And back to you, Pedro. Thanks, everybody. Uh... Let me just uh, take a moment to breathe deeply because we have been going extremely fast. Um, as you see, there is actually a lot of content. Uh, just to highlight a few points, right? So from, from Jans and Marx and, and Siva's comments, I think that I hope that this makes it clear uh, that vision picture that I showed in the beginning of my presentation, you know, that we had the curve and the other curve saying, you know, our machines are not uh, going to be fully programmable today but they are at scale bringing us as close as possible to this computing edge right so you have heard people say i didn't say it right other people said it that it would be very very hard to simulate some of the systems that uh, that we are creating and, and analyzing and uh, um and uh, i think that uh, uh, 
this is exactly what we are hoping people to see and try and do, right? To really run jobs and problems at system sizes that are, are hard to, to achieve and to, to simulate classically, to see what comes out from it. So uh, uh, also to Siva's point on the workflow, uh, it's actually indeed very common to, to simulate on blockade, optimize parameters, then run on Acula. Uh, the classical simulation, I think that it's always necessary for you to understand if what you're going to submit is going to work. But you can also run closed loop optimizations directly at Acula, right? There's uh, no reason for you to believe that, uh, you know, the, the, the best optimization that you did for your post sequences, et cetera, your algorithm, right, that you did at small scale will be the necessarily the best at large scales. And it is possible to run hybrid jobs in, you know, classical quantum so that you can optimize directly for like 200 atoms, optimize your, your protocols to, to generate the states that you want and control the dynamics as, as you want. So uh, I hope this convinced also you that these machines, they are not annealers. You see a lot of annealing type of uh, protocols that we like to show because they are kind of easy to explain. But uh, these are quantum dynamics machines. You can do annealing, you can do quenches, as uh, Siva was just showing. You can do floquet pulses, so you can, you know, repetitive drives, etc. There's a lot of that you can try to do here. Now, given that, so much for taking a deep breath, right? I'm speaking fast as a, <laughs> but uh, uh, I want to jump to uh, a little bit of our uh, kind of a training, really, uh, session and uh, talk to you about the basics of uh, using blockade to run simulations. And uh, hopefully from there, uh, tomorrow we will be able to spend some time uh, uh, talking about a few applications uh, directly, like a, a little bit of the physics of this. So uh, usually I do this in really a, a the, the, the sessions, they are really supposed to be training sessions. So it's supposed to be lectures. There, there's, there's a lot of active learning involved with it. But uh, because we were condensing today, um, this is going to be a little bit more fast paced and a little more expositive. Hope that's a word in English, right? I'm going to expose uh, and uh, uh, it's, it's going to be more passive on your side than, than active. But I hope that you have uh, your the Jupyter notebooks and the uh, blockade installed tomorrow we will perhaps be able to to catch up and uh, you know do this a little bit more slowly so that you can run jobs together uh, with me as we we go along so uh, I'm gonna just skip this because it's not necessary for today and we're gonna start from uh, a little bit of where we we passed by before so we're gonna be talking about neutral atom quantum processors how they work and uh, why this is exciting, I, I hope I don't need to justify anymore because I think that's what we had just heard. I, I hope that has motivated everyone. So I'm going to stick to a few learning objectives for today, which include that uh, uh, by the end of this session, I hope that you'll be able to explain how neutral atoms can be used as a platform for quantum computing. We already brushed a little bit through it, but uh, we are going to go in more details of uh, like how this works. Uh, I hope that you'll be able to distinguish analog and digital computing, but we already also discussed that. Uh, um, and uh, we will be also defining the field programmable qubit arrays. You see that uh, uh, a lot of this we have already covered. But the most important is to be able to describe Aculus programming range. So what are the what's the Hamiltonian? What does it look like? What are the controllable parameters by the user? And what are the... I call it limitations of service, really. But this is just, uh, you have to remember that Acula is, you know, it runs like an experiment. So it, uh, there, are, there are things that it can do, things that it cannot do, right? So we're going to go through that. So a uh, quick reminder of uh, how we create uh, computers. So we use rubidium atoms. Again, a quick reminder for you, uh, if you don't remember where rubidium is, here's where it goes. It goes on your first column of the periodic table looks like hydrogen, one electron that is free for you to play with. You can use the ground state. It's going to be a 5S state. The other state is the Rydberg state. It's like a 70S. So 70 is like, you know, it's a lot of quantum number for a principal quantum number, uh, uh, but it's not ionized. So these atoms are never ionized. They come, you know, as nature gave us. 
um, we keep the electrons there. Uh, but it is important to notice, again, this is really a physics concept, right? So the polariz polarizability of a neutral body increases with the volume of the body. And uh, when you put this atom excited in the Rydberg state, so the, the, the uh, effective size of, the, of an atom goes with uh, the principal quantum number to power two, three, I think three. Uh, so it really, really increases kind of a thousand fold when you excite it like that. And uh, because of that, this puffed atom, it becomes highly polarizable and atoms that are, are you know, bodies that are polarizable put close together, they interact, they polarize each other. Uh, it's kind of a second order perturbation theory phenomenon. It's a Van der Waals type of inter interaction that's going to appear. If dipole falls with one over R3, second order perturbation theory is going to give us something that goes with one over R6, as I'm going to show uh, pretty soon. As I was mentioning before, a register is going to be a set of atoms that are going to place in 2D plane. And by the way, I, I want to also take a moment to highlight the link that Dan put uh, on uh, the chat. Please post questions there. We will answer them uh, uh, as uh, you know as we go along. But uh, uh, save those questions there. Uh, I know that we are going fast. It's hard to keep up. But uh, parenthesis closed. So we're talking about what a register looks like. As I was saying, you have atoms. You can place them in 2D. The user defines how it's going to be placed here in this example. So the atoms are the circle, the, the blue uh, circles. They are being positioned in this kind of honeycomb square uh, 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 hexagonal lattice. But of course, the user can redefine that. The lasers will come in this system from above and in the plane of the atoms. So the lasers that are going to come from above, they're the lasers that hold the atoms in place. So there's a little forest of lasers that uh, actually are piercing this atomic cloud uh, and holding them in place. And uh, by using this out of plane dimension, we can play with the lasers and move them about with something called an acoustic optical deflector and uh, reposition atoms and move them around. The in plane laser, so the green thing here is an in plane laser that is going to shine and pick up all atoms all at once. Okay, and uh, by doing that, we're going to be able to generate uh, gates that are going to operate at a massive scale, right? A many body, like 256 atoms all at once. So what you need to know as a user is that you have to play with two things. Thing number one is the geometry. Thing number two is the dynamics. Controlling dynamics is the same thing as controlling an algorithm, right? So whenever you are picking up a quantum gates and composing them, say, ah, do this, do that, blah, blah, blah. So you're playing with the dynamics of uh, your set of qubits, and that's what's, what composes an algorithm. Here, besides that, you also get to play with the geometry, right? So what do you want your register to look like? Why do you want your register to look like that? Because this register is a physical thing, there will be limitations to what are the geometries that you can choose. And uh, I think that the first step for us is to discuss what these limitations are. So I'm putting here two, uh, nine atoms to you for you uh, in a kind of arbitrary way. And I want uh, to discuss what are the, the constraints of the hardware. So the first thing to know is that uh, there is a, a error in positioning the atoms, which is 0.1 microns. The second thing to know is that I moved this figure around and now things are not placed in the correct place anymore. But uh, uh, there's a minimum distance radial between the, the atoms, which is four micrometers. And I think that this is an interesting point of, of view to, to realize, right? So the, the correct scale for geometry here is micrometer. So everything is going to be micrometer. Usually when you program a computer, you don't need to, to know, you know, uh, what, what's the dimension of uh, a logical gate, right? So that, that doesn't, that, that's not such a thing. But for Aquila, you actually need to know dimensions, right? So everything is physical here. So uh, the scale for geometry is going to be micrometer, and we're going to get to the uh, scale for time soon. Uh, next thing is that whatever is you're going to do with your atoms, there's going to be a, a play field. This play field is going to be 75 microns in the x direction. 
by 76 microns in the y direction. It's a little bit more elongated in the y direction to motivate you to, if you want to create extended structures, to prefer the y direction. There are some technical reasons for that. We don't need to go through, through that today. But uh, the point is, you have a space that is 75 microns by 76 microns. You want to put atoms in there more or less arbitrarily, not fully. Uh, you see that there's a minimum distance of four microns, which means that, uh, yes, Aquila can have 256 qubits. That depends on the geometry that you're going to do. So if you want to do a, like a single 1D linear chain, you cannot fit 256 atoms in 75 microns if they have a minimal distance of four microns between them. So that's something for you to keep in mind. Another thing that you want to keep in mind is that there is uh, some limitations on uh, the actual arbitrariness of the positioning of the atoms as well. So when you look at rows in, along the y direction, uh, so, well, along the x direction, but rows in a given y height, uh, the atoms have to be placed in uh, in rows. Okay, so you cannot uh, put them arbitrarily, like fluidly, uh, uh, in different positions in the y direction. They always line lie on along lines, and this is related to how we sort these atoms in place. It's a limitation that uh, is going to be overcome in the future uh, hardware generations, but today. That's how it goes. So atoms, they cannot be placed arbitrarily. They have to be placed in a minimum distance. Well, the, the, the closest that they can go is four microns. And they have to be displaced, displayed in uh, rows along the, the, you know, in X direction here for each y, y height. The minimal distance between these rows is also four micrometers. I want to explain to you now on blockade our software, how to do that, how to generate these quantum registers. And uh, I hope to convince you that Blockade is quite easy to use, actually. So Blockade is written in Julia. Some people feel uh, see that as a blocker. But uh, again, I want to convince you that it's very, very easy to use because everything is packaged for you. So if everything got installed, uh, you would be able to run this notebook by yourself. There are, there are two functions that are important for a user when you're trying to generate an, uh, a quantum register of atoms. The first function is called atom list. So you're going to take atom list, you're going to feed to atom list a list of tuples, which are going to be the x and y positions of each atom that are gonna, is going to form your register. So here I'm putting an atom in 0, 0, another atom in 0 in the x direction and five in the y direction, five micrometers. So everything here is uh, is read in micrometers. Okay. Um, so yes, so that's it. Julia is going to interpret this list and is going to set as the kind of the dimension, the the the, the type of the the parameters that you're gonna do use as the kind of the most complex parameters that you use. So you can see that we are setting some integers and some uh, reals. But when you look at uh, Julia, Julia is seeing tuples of real numbers exactly because we put one pair of real numbers there. If, I don't know, you decide, define what uh, your, is going to be your list of atoms and you place it inside this atom coordinate variable, you forgot for some reason, you hit your head and you forgot what is inside it, you can just uh, call your variable say dot atoms and boom it's going to tell you exactly what lies inside that atom list that you define but more interesting than doing that if you simply tell blockade to you just run the the atom list that you created by itself blockade is pretty cool it's going to generate a little figure for you showing you exactly where each atom is lying so if this does not look like the register that you wanted to create, you will see right away and say, oh, no, 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 this is completely wrong. So it, it helps you with imaging. Another thing that is important to notice in Julia is that uh, uh, Julia is a compiled language. So it takes a while the first time you run a job, but every time afterwards, it's super fast. 
So whenever you play with these things, it's always nice to run, I don't know, like a problem with two qubits and then you simulate uh, really for like 12 afterwards. You don't run the first time with 12 because that's slow. Um, so there's some exercise here. If you remember that uh, the, the folder that I gave you uh, in the beginning, I pointed you to, uh, there is going to be a handout and you can use that handout. It's going to have some atoms displays, displayed in, uh, in real space. So you can uh, actually use that as a little exercise and uh, to play with this atom list function. So I'm going to leave that for you to play with later. Uh, it's going to be very convenient for tomorrow if you play with it today. Uh, but yeah, you can just uh, call atom list and position the atoms according to the handout and uh, and create a register, your own first quantum register. I said that there was two functions. Function one that is interesting is atom list. Function two is called generate sites. Generate sites assumes that uh, uh, sometimes you will not want to create a list that is uh, arbitrary. But actually, we want to generate something like this that has like a lattice with a structure. And there are many, many lattices, right? Particularly if you work in condensed matter physics, there are square lattices, honeycomb, triangular lattices, Lebel lattices, Galgama lattices. So, so you have many lattices, and they're all here pre-coded for you on blockade. So if you just call generate sites and you feed it the lattice that you want, the number of unit cells and the uh, the unit uh, of uh, the, the 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 you know the, the the lattice parameter, right? So this is measured in micrometer. It will automatically generate uh, generate a, 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 a an atom list object for you that uh, is going to contain the atoms exactly in the positions of uh, your your lattice, right? So if I call lib lattice here, if you never saw lib lattice. It's going to generate a little lattice for you. So it's like a square lattice with some decorated uh, bases of two atoms. And it's going to do that for you. So this is pretty convenient. Uh, so those are the two functions that uh, um, that you that you have, atom list and generate site. And you can see that uh, you don't really need to know much of Julia here to be able to use these functions, right? So it's everything packed. You, you just put the tuples. And it's going to generate everything for you. If there are comments on this, please, uh, again, write them on the Q&A doc. We will cover them later. Uh, back to our presentation here. So we have just gone through the geometry. We need to also go through dynamics, because dynamics is the algorithm, right? So the algorithm is the time evolution that you do. So you go from point A to point B. We are going to be focusing on this picture, right, in this mindset that we have one big quantum unitary that's going to operate on all qubits at once, exactly because that laser that I was mentioning before, we're going to get back to it again, is going to shine on all atoms at once. This unitary is a, a time evolution operator. And as Siva was mentioning, a time evolution operator is controlled by a single function parameter matrix that is called the Hamiltonian. So as a user, you have to pick the geometry and to control the algorithm, you have to know what's the Hamiltonian. Sometimes people laugh that there is no way of seeing a query presentation without seeing a Hamiltonian. So I'm just going to get that, uh, you know, the, the awkward moment out of the way. And I will just show you the Hamiltonian once and for all. So this is what uh, the Rydberg Hamiltonian looks like uh, for the systems that we can simulate. It contains three terms, so each of the, the sums here. And we're going to go through them step by step. So the first one of them contains this omega parameter. The jargon is we call it a Rabi term because it makes you jump from ground to Rydberg and Rydberg to ground, uh, which means it's a, a qubit flip, right? If this is 0 and 1, it 0 goes to 1, 1 goes to 0. It's like an X gate type of uh, term. And if if you prepare a qubit in the ground state and you apply uh, omega term, you're going to see it oscillating. That oscillation is called a Rabi oscillation. Therefore, we call omega the Rabi term. The origin of this Rabi term is on this green laser that is shining in the plane of the atoms. And because of that, omega does not 
depend on the site i. Don't confuse this i with that i, right? This i here is just uh, the, the imaginary number. This i is the kind of the label of a given atom. So omega does not depend on i exactly because it's shining on everybody all at once. So it's, an, it's a global drive, okay? And that's one of the reasons why we don't do individual gates is because we do control everybody all at once. So omega is a rabbit term. Phi is called a phase because it's a phase because you put in an exponential, a complex exponential and the parameter that goes on top of it and in front of it is a phase, right? So it's the thing that allows you to pick up, uh, oh my God, I'm going to say it again, phase uh, between uh, the, the atoms and uh, it allows you to do not only X rotations, but also Y type of rotations um, in these atoms. So there you go. These are the guys that allow you to flip from zero to one, one to zero. The next term is a diagonal term. So this N is just a number. So it counts zero in the ground state, one in the Rydberg state. So it's like a sigma Z, just it's um, kind of uh, biased to, to zero, one instead of plus minus one half. And the parameter that controls it is this delta. And delta is called a detuning. It's a detuning because if we have a, a, some laser trying to excite you from ground to Rydberg, and what this guy is doing is to kind of do a um, start shift that puts the atom out of uh, resonance with the laser that uh, causes the excitation. And that becomes kind of a penalty in, in energy cost for that atom. So that's why we call it a detuning. Delta is also generated by the uh, laser that goes in plane of the atoms. So delta also does not depend on I. But this delta and omega and phi depend on time. And the user gets to pick what that time dependence looks like. So those waveforms is what we're going to learn to control in a moment. The last piece of this Hamiltonian that is important and probably the most important is the interaction term. So without this fellow in the end, there is no interaction. If there's no interaction, there's no entanglement. So this interaction term uh, is a van der Waals type of interaction. So it decays with the distance between qubit i and qubit j to power 6. Okay, So it's 1 over the distance to power 6. And this guy, you can see that it costs zero energy if either of the qubits is in the ground state, but it's going to cost Vij when both qubits are excited, right? So both atoms being on state uh, like uh, Rydberg, then this is equal to 1, 1, 1 times 1 is 1, and 1 times V is 1V, and 1V is V. <laughs> so that's the amount of energy that it's going to cost for you to have two atoms excited at the same time. Those are the three terms that are, uh, appear in the Hamiltonian. This last term, you also control, but you do not control it in time. You control it with the geometry, right? So this guy costs a V. This V depends on the distance between the atoms. And as we were just discussing, you choose where the atoms go. So you can control what's the intensity of this V that are, the atoms are going to feel through a calculation. I hope that this is clear. Again, we are going to, through this at a, a little bit of light speed. This delta and this omega and this phi is what we're going to discuss right now. So we already learned how to send tell blockade to generate a register. Now we're going to learn how to create um, waveforms, so dynamics. Blockade actually can put atoms in any distance possible in the geometry. But when you try to submit a job to Aquila, Aquila is going to complain. It's going to, ah, it's going to scream at you if you are not satisfying those hardware constraints of four microns, etc. Same thing applies for waveforms, right? So waveforms on blockade, you can do them smooth, et cetera, et cetera. But Aquila is going to have a few limitations. So I'm giving you some examples for omega, delta, and phi. And the lesson is that uh, for Aquila, omega and delta will always read piecewise linear functions, OK? So the, the, the resolution of these functions is actually quite high. So you can make quasi-sinusoids with it. But that those quasi sinusoids, they're going to be you know, pixelated in some sense because it's going to be made of piecewise linear segments. Phi, however, is done in piecewise constant. So it's like you, you set a phase and uh, you can make that phase jump. Uh, um, but uh, but uh, uh, that's how you define it. The maximum value for omega 
for Aquila is order 2.5 uh, uh, cycles per second, so 2 pi megahertz. That's an AMO physicist thing. So uh, for all that I care, I all think of this as megahertz, but there's a factor of 2 pi that goes there. Uh, that's important to remember. So 2.5 uh, 2 pi megahertz is the maximum value of omega possible. The maximum value of delta, so delta, the detuning, goes from negative to posi positive values, and it's going to be 20 to pi megahertz. Uh, and the phi, of course, uh, phi is a phase, so you can you can go everywhere between zero and two pi, and and, and beyond. It's it's just going to oscillate. The maximum amount of uh, uh, the the length of a calculation is going to be four microseconds. I guess that in Jan's uh, uh, presentation before, he was showing a little bit of some uh, some uh, oscillations that we could keep all the way to four microseconds. But uh, those are the the parameters that a user of Aquila has to know if you're doing this on blockade again all of this is much more flexible but uh we want people to be running jobs in the actual quantum computer so because of that it's we find it's important to know these numbers if you look at the blockade documentation page uh in the blockade documentation page there is going to be a, a very very extensive page covering all the limitations of the hardware that you can think of so that you can know what are the you know the error bars on position on on everything given that how do we do waveforms so let's take a look at it there is two functions again so before we were looking at atom list and uh, and the um, uh, generate sites now we're going to be looking at two functions that are going to be operating actually in the same way one is called piecewise linear and the other is called piecewise constant. And uh, the way you deal with piecewise linear and piecewise constant as functions is you simply feed clocks, being the x parameter here, the, or the time parameters, where you're going to see the beginning and end of a linear segment, and the values, the values being the, you know, the, the y value of each of the, you know, the, the x position of the clocks. So 0, 0 is a point here. Then we are looking at 0 0.2, 1 1.5. So 0 0.2, 1 1.5 is there. So this is our first segment. And then pa, 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 is, you know, you just keep following this structure and it's going to generate a waveform for you. Blockade <coughs> can compose waveforms. You know, you can put them together. You, you add, technically multiply waveforms so that you can compose complicated uh, structures. Uh, the piecewise constant function is going to do exactly the same, except that uh, the values now they are just going to be pointing at uh, you know the the, the 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 plateau values here of this piecewise constant function. Uh, and it's as simple as that. Okay, the, 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 these things they run fast, and uh, you can get your functions. Uh, tomorrow we are going to teach you how to put these waveforms together into actual algorithms and run problems. I'm going to leave you at this. There are some exercises here that you. I also encourage you to look at uh, where we picked up some waveforms from the blockade documentation page. And the idea is to look at this and think uh, what these waveforms, what kind of algorithm these are corresponding to, right? So like what kind of applications do they correspond to? Like, um, uh, I know that I'm not giving you details, like enough information to know that. So this is an exercise in creativity, but uh, it's really to, to help you start to drawing your intuition because this is very different from gate-based quantum computing. So uh, you should start building an intuition of uh, what a given protocol like this is doing to your atoms and what's going to be the consequence. So piecewise linear, piecewise constant functions, generate sites and atom lists. So that's the basics, okay? So you don't need much more than that. Uh, everything other than that is just going to be like, you know, simulate. And then Blockade is going to do the simulation for you. We're going to look at it tomorrow. Uh, we already went through a little bit of uh, efficient problem encoding. Another thing that is inter interesting to realize is that uh, because your the user can redefine the register as desired, you can transform a big problem into sm multiple smaller problems, right? So if it turns out that you don't need 
at 200, all 256 qubits for your application, you can increase the throughput of your problem by simply multiplexing their quantum register into you know, smaller clusters. And here you're seeing smaller clusters of three by three atoms and uh, running your calculation in those smaller clusters. So particularly for, for 1D systems, right? You can make 1D chains and make several 1D chains kind of far from each other. They don't see each other. And then you can run uh, uh, larger data sets uh, in, in, a, in a given time. And that's it. I hope that uh, uh, we covered everything. So we talked a little bit about the architecture, what it looks like. We talked about both uh, analog and digital operation modes. We talked about uh, this FPQA paradigm. So the use of uh, the, the geometry repositioning of uh, the atoms as uh, a way to create uh, efficient solutions for a given problem. And we covered hardware constraints, both geometric and dynamic. So I'm going to leave you with the learning goals. And I will actually take uh, a few minutes to see if we can get some questions in kind of directly, because uh, otherwise, uh, yeah, I think that it's good to have questions. So I thank you. And uh, I will just stop sharing and just take questions. Thanks, Pedro. There are some questions that people wrote in the Q&A. So I don't know if you want to start there. Yeah, yeah. Let me let me start by by just sharing with everyone the questions that people have been asking in the Q and A uh, page here. So uh, somebody has asked how Aquila overcomes uh, error correction, and the answer is it does not. <laughs> so not today. So Aquila uh, takes you know takes the arrows face the arrows face front and just swallows them, right? Uh, um, so you can improve performance by. Uh, optimizing control pulses. And, uh, uh, but uh, error correction is something that is going to be deployed in our next generation devices only. So the, it makes sense to worry about that when we are doing uh, our gate-based computing. Given that for a lot of these uh, adiabatic uh, methods, there are kind of counter-diabatic methods that are you know, developed to to kind of overcome a little bit of the errors that you would uh, incur on a, a, an algorithm. So given a, an adiabatic quantum circuit in Fiskit or other platforms, does there exist an API method or some other ways to help us to compile that, compile that circuit to blockade? Blockade is not currently integrated to any other uh, platform. So it's really made for neutral atoms. And uh, as we see the other uh, systems, they, they kind of, they're not. So Penny Lane, QuizKit, they, they are more general. Given that, uh, if your goal is to submit jobs to Aquila, for example, through the Amazon bracket service, uh, there are other venues, okay? So uh, in particular, Penny Lane has a package to operating on Amazon. And uh, that's one way, one alternative way of, uh, of submitting jobs. Or of course, there's the Amazon SDK as well. But if you're going from blockade, uh, I, I, the suggestion would be to learn blockade and uh, submit from blockade to Aquila and from blockade to your own simulations to Perlmutter, as uh, Katie was uh, showing, this has been done already. So there's a lot that is already in place to help you. By the way, Blockade also has HPC, like multi-threading, GPU support. Uh, you know, it, it comes with the whole package. How are atoms physically constrained to a point in 3D space? Yeah, I, I think that uh, there is an answer here by then. The answer is that there are laser lights. So laser is not, uh, you know, you, you look, uh, you watch Star Wars, you think that lightsabers is just a straight thing. Laser actually has a waist, right? So it's uh, it's like a, something more or less like this, right? exaggerating. So this focal point holds the atom uh, in, in the kind of the laser direction. And then you can position the laser arbitrarily in the 2D plane. So this fixes the position of an atom in 3D space. Uh, curious about the connection you mentioned between atom shuttling and error correction. Is the atom clustering that I showed how the redundancy is built into the qubits? Uh, so we are still building the pipeline for error correction, but um, 
it's going to be slightly different. Uh, the atom clustering is an interesting idea for doing um, a transversal gates. For like, if you if you encode a logical qubit into a cluster of atoms, you can actually bring them together and then tangle them, kind of do the logical gates like all together. But uh, uh, the, there there are a few caveats. It's a little more complicated than that. So um, uh, uh, error correction is something that is in the works. So stay tuned. Um, how does ACLA do digital computing application? For example, Grover's algorithm. And the answer is it does not, right? ACLA only does our analog computing today. So there will be a few other features that allow will allow you to control the local energy of the atoms, the local detuning that I was showing, the delta will be able to depend a little bit on, on the positions. But uh, um, to do gates, the architecture is actually completely different, right? So we go from, ACLA operates only two quantum states. We're going to operate in three quantum states, as I was mentioning. So it's uh, a, a little more uh, uh, involved. We covered questions. Uh, I'd be happy to take more. Either on the, on the, the you know, the, the Q&A document or even here if you want. Yeah, feel free to speak up if you have a question. If not, then uh, if you think of one, please write it in the doc. And uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Pedro, for leading us. Uh, and we hope to see you all tomorrow at the same time for part two of the training. Yes. And tomorrow, again, we are going to, uh, you know, finish what we started, right? It's always good to finish what we start. So, so we're actually going to go to the end of uh, submitting some, uh, some actual simulations to blockade and you'll see how it goes. So thanks, everyone, and see you tomorrow. Bye.